Excellent. So welcome back to this final part of the student's presentation. We have uh, three projects remaining. Uh, so let's start with the first one. So Alina and Asmita, can you share the screen, please? Uh, so this is would be project 14, which is uh, uh, titled Tackling Quantum Many Body Systems with Artificial Neural Networks. And uh, it was supervised uh, by, by Joe Basin and myself. So please, Alina, uh, uh, go ahead to start. Thank you. Uh, can everyone see my screen? Yes. The presentation? Okay. Yes. Um, as me too. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so hello everyone. Uh, I'm Asmita and I've been working with Alina uh, on project 14, uh, which is basically tackling quantum many body systems with artificial neural networks. And we have been supervised by Dr. Joe and Dr. Isaac. So we'll start with an introduction of what is a quantum many body system. So it is basically a fundamental class of physical systems uh, that involve a large number of interacting particles whose behavior and properties uh, can be studied in detail using the first principles of quantum mechanics. So for example, we have uh, superconducting magnets, we have the nuclear many body problem where we try to understand the different forces and correlations between the nucleons or for example, take nanomaterials where we want to study the electron emission spectra, the band structure, et cetera, uh, using quantum mechanics. And several different theories have already been proposed to study them, but uh, as of now, only a small subsection of their properties ha have been effectively studied. So what you see in the box is essentially a wave function uh, of a simple one-dimensional spin chain with n spins. Uh, it contains the probability amplitudes for each configuration of the constituent particles. In, in general, they are complex valued. So here for n particles, uh, we, would need to we would need to prescribe two to the power n amplitudes uh, to completely describe uh, the entire system. And therefore, uh, studying systems that are mentioned above can become uh, difficult because the Hilbert space uh, that is associated, uh, it increases exponentially with the increase in the number of particles. Uh, and the Schrodinger equation uh, that you see there, it becomes increasingly harder to solve uh, for the energy eigenvalues. And therefore we try to make use of an artificial neural network to learn and solve for the ground state energy as we will discuss further. So for the next slide, we have artificial neural networks. Uh, it is basically an abstract implementation of a biological neural network, where in a biological neural network, the signals are received from the dendrites and a bias is applied to them and it's then passed on to the cell body. And uh, then it is sent down the axon once enough signals are received at, at a particular time. And the output that is received at the axon terminals then serves as an input to another neuron through the synapse and, and the process continues. And artificial neurons are also modeled in a similar way uh, by accepting binary inputs and then uh, applying weights to them and, uh, and uh, checking whether the sum of these weighted inputs uh, have reached a certain threshold, which is also called a step function. And depending on that, the neuron will decide to fire or not. And then a nonlinear activation function uh, acts on this sum. Uh, which basically restricts the range of values uh, uh, that, that uh, the network can output. Next, we discuss uh, what is called a neural network quantum states, which we'll be using throughout our presentation. So essentially, whenever we try to find a ground state using uh, variational approaches, we propose a trial wave function um, as an insatz, and then use some mathematical operations and we see how close the NSARDS is, uh, is to the actual wave function. Uh, Carleo and Troyer, uh, for the first time, proposed the use of a restricted Boltzmann machine, which is a stochastic generative uh, artificial neural network. Uh, and they proposed it as a variational many body wave function, NSARDS. And they discuss it in this very interesting paper from Science that was published in 2017. 
coming to the structure of the RBM, uh, it has a visible layer and a hidden layer. The visible layer takes uh, uh, an, uh, an n-body spin configuration. Uh, essentially, it takes n discrete degrees of freedom uh, as, it, as its input. And these might be bosonic occupation numbers or some other discrete values as well. Uh, the weights WIJ uh, are the network parameters that are updated using a feedback technique in the form of reinforcement learning uh, across iterations uh, to optimize the response of, of the restricted Boltzmann machine. Uh, for this particular problem, uh, we have a single output, which is basically the probability amplitude to observe the particular spin configuration uh, in a given basis. And uh, as you can see that there are no intralayer connections between either the visible layer or the hidden layer. So the terms HI, which can take values with only plus one and minus one, they can be explicitly traced out. And then the final expression becomes independent of HI, which can then be written as a product of some function S. So S is your uh, many body spin configuration. And this function uh, involves a hyperbolic cosine term uh, that involves the hidden biases and, and the weights. And so now I'll hand over to Alina, who will take you through the quantum model under study and the methods and the software that we used. Yes, so we're looking at the one dimensional transverse field IC model, um, which is a model of interacting spins one half on a chain. And additionally, we apply the transverse field in X direction. And the Hamiltonian is then composed of two terms. The J term describes the interaction between the spins, where J denotes the interaction strength. And the gamma term describes the interaction of the spins with the transverse field, where gamma denotes the strength of the magnetic field. Um, in the phase diagram um, on the right, um, which describes the system in terms of magnetization versus the ratio of gamma over J, it is possible to see that at uh, gamma over j equals one, a phase transition takes place. There, the system transitions from an ordered ferromagnetic phase to a uh, disordered paramagnetic phase. And in the ferromagnetic phase, there are uh, two cases. If j is bigger than zero, the interaction is ferromagnetic, and the spin, the majority of the spins, uh, point up. And if J is smaller than zero, uh, this is the anti-ferromagnetic phase and the, the most spins uh, point down. Um, the one-dimensional transverse field IC model can be solved exactly with the Jordan-Wigner transformation. This transformation uses the fact that spins one half in one dimension behave like fermions, which enables us to rewrite the Hamiltonian in a way that makes it easier to solve, especially for the transverse uh, field, which is something as meter will uh, come back to. And um, next, um, we used uh, NetCat, which is an open source software for simulating quantum many body systems with neural networks. And it was developed by Khalil and uh, several others. Um, using either inbuilt or custom built uh, Hamiltonians and applying neural networks and enables us to find ground state properties uh, such as the ground state energy for a given system. And we're following a method previously used by Kalio and Troyer, where we implemented a system using an inbuilt Hamiltonian as well as comparing it to our results from a custom Hamiltonian on a non-trivial lattice graph and used neural networks uh, specifically uh, a restricted Boltzmann machine, as, as Mita mentioned, uh, to try to find the ground state energy. And other observables like the magnetization and the static correlation functions. And we run the optimization for 800 iterations. After each iteration, the parameters are updated using Metropolis Hastings sampling, which proposes a new spin state with a certain transition probability. In the diagram, uh, you can see the convergence of the ground state energy to the exact value for uh, gamma of j equals one, comparing those results from the inbuilt icing operator in black uh, and the results from the custom built operator in red. 
and these results converge to the exact value, the blue line obtained by exact diagonalization. And as you can see, after about 200 iterations, they are almost indistinguishable from the exact result. Um, the ground state problem, um, so it, the, it consists of finding a good approximation of the ground state energy and the minimization of the ground state was achieved by using variational sampling to compare the machine learning results. We use exact diagonalization to solve for the ground state energy. And the variational energy can be made nearly equal to the exact ground state energy for a trial wave function that is a good approximation of the original ground state wave function. Um, in the diagram, you can see in red the restricted Boltzmann machine result for a 20 spin system in comparison to the exact diagonalization result in blue. Uh, the results for the ground state energy are plotted versus the iterations again in the machine learning process. And it is clear to see how the uh, restricted Boltzmann machine result converges to the exact diagonalization result with increasing iterations. Um, in this case, due to the fact that gamma over j equals one, um, which is the point of phase transition, this convergence happens slower than it would above or below the this ratio since there are large fluctuations around the critical point. And although exact diagonalization is limited to small system sizes, since the Hilbert space grows exponentially with the system size, um, the restricted Boltzmann machine can be used to simulate systems with sizes well beyond exact diagonalization. Uh, in our case, the exact diagonalization broke down for about 25 spins. And I will now hand over to Yasmita, who will present and explain more about our results. Yeah, so now I'll take you through the error analysis where we try to find the error in the ground state energy uh, calculated using a restricted Boltzmann machine uh, relative to the energy that we found by using exact diagonalization. Uh, here, the energy, uh, which is basically the expectation value of the Hamiltonian over the ground state, it's the loss function that, uh, that needs to be minimized. And uh, this is a function of the parameter alpha. So alpha is basically the ratio M by N, uh, which is the number of hidden nodes in the restricted Boltzmann machine to the number of uh, visible nodes. And the alpha dependence comes from the representation of the wave function that is present uh, in our energy formula. Uh, from the graph, as you can see, uh, that as alpha increases, the variational energy uh, E of N decreases, and it eventually converges to the energy obtained using exact diagonalization within a, a very small range of error uh, and this error keeps on decreasing with increasing alpha. Uh, the rate of this decrease also increases as uh, the gamma over J ratio keeps on reducing uh, uh, as we plotted here uh, for three different cases. And even though the error never really reaches zero as we would expect from uh, any stochastic machine learning algorithm, uh, nevertheless, we do achieve a fair degree of accuracy with a modest number of hidden nodes. Uh, all of this, however, does come with a computational cost, uh, and the cost is linearly dependent on alpha. Uh, so now we move to the next slide, uh, supervised learning. So uh, learning from data using machine learning algorithms can either be supervised or unsupervised. Uh, for the unsupervised case, uh, for quantum many body systems, we have a technique called quantum state tomography that we don't cover in this presentation. Uh, we used supervised learning for our problem. So for a supervised learning problem, uh, we would then need to provide the data, including an input vector X and an output label Y. The neural network would then, uh, is then trained to learn the mapping from, the neural network is then asked to learn. There is a noise, let me locate it. I think it's yeah. Sorry, uh, apologize for that. Uh, please carry on. Yeah, sure. Uh, 
So the neural network is then basically asked to learn a mapping from uh, the vector X to the target label Y. Uh, in our case, the input is, is the spin basis and the output is the coefficient of the corresponding spin basis. So it's basically uh, the probability amplitude of finding a given state uh, in a particular con configuration. Uh, we take the target state as the exact wave function that we obtained using uh, exact diagonalization and the variational state is the one that needs to be optimized uh, uh, to reach uh, the target state. Uh, the gradient is estimated by performing a Monte Carlo sampling of, of different overlaps, uh, overlap distributions. So the overlap here is between uh, the target and uh, the neural network quantum state wave function. It's essentially uh, the modulus of the expectation value. Uh, the alpha is updated using a stochastic gradient descent optimization according to the rule that is shown here, uh, where lambda is the learning rate. So let's the value of the loss function uh, given in the formula, which is essentially a negative logarithm. More is the overlap and uh, Therefore, better is the convergence of the, of the trial wave function um, to the actual wave function. And we plot the graph of overlap versus iterations for different learning rates. And we see that more the learning rate, the faster and better is the, is the convergence to the target wave function. Uh, however, this is limited to many body systems where the exact wave function is known either analytically or using some reliable numerical approaches. So a question uh, necessarily arises, why would we use this when we already know uh, the exact wave function? Uh, the answer would be that the optimized ground state can be used to predict um, excited states uh, uh, using supervised learning for systems whose excited states are numerically or analytically hard to find. And one such work in quantum chemistry has been done uh, and it has been described in the paper that's referenced here. Uh, next, we move on to one of the observables of the quantum Ising model, uh, which is the magnetization. Uh, the transverse magnetization is determined by the ground state expectation value of the uh, Pauli X operator. Uh, uh, as you can see, the graph of uh, MX versus gamma uh, versus gamma over J, it's plotted using a restricted Boltzmann machine wave function, and it's shown in black and the exact diagonalization, uh, and it's shown in red. And uh, they are compared with the closed form integral that was solved by Fioti, and this is shown in blue. And we observe a very close agreement. So for gamma by j is equal to zero, or essentially where gamma is very, very much less than j, the transverse field is very weak to the, um, to the interacting spin term, and therefore none of the spins are aligned in the transverse uh, field direction, which is why we obtain an expectation value of, of zero. Uh, as the ratio increases, we obtain a phase transition uh, at close to one. And when uh, gamma by J, like when gamma increases much more than J, uh, or the gamma by J ratio is much more than one, almost all the spins are aligned along the transverse field and hence we get a magnetization value almost equal to one. Uh, in the next slide, we also look at uh, magnetization. Uh, yeah. uh, in the next slide, we also look at magnetization, uh, but this is the longitudinal magnetization uh, 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 in the Z direction, which is referred to as MZ. So ideally for uh, gamma less than one, a non-zero magnetization has been theoretically shown to exist in the Z direction while it becomes zero at the critical point, uh, gamma is equal to j is equal to one. And further beyond as we venture into the uh, paramagnetic disordered phase. Now, MZ uh, is way harder to learn, uh, sorry, way harder to calculate uh, than MX uh, due to the non-local nature of the spins given by the jordan wigner transformation that was, that was briefly described by Alina before and possibly due to the absence of spontaneous uh, symmetry uh, breaking in the ordered state of a, of a finite uh, size system when we are very far off uh, the thermodynamical limit. Uh, so to solve this, uh, we apply a small but a finite uh, longitudinal field uh, and the field strength is given by gamma one so that the Z2 symmetry is broken. Uh, as you can see in the graph, our results using a restricted Boltzmann machine are quite far 
of the analytical limit solution in red. Uh, however, we expect that if we keep on reducing the longitudinal field, we might gradually converge uh, to the exact solution. Uh, we try to study another observable, uh, which is the spin-spin correlation functions. Uh, so correlations functions essentially describe how two spins influence each other at a given distance apart. And specifically, it's, it's a measure of the probability as to what extent the spin at a lattice site I is aligned with the spin at another lattice site J. Uh, the longitudinal correlation function is given by the expectation value of the tensor product of the Pauli Z operators at two different sites I and J. And uh, similarly, the transverse correlation uh, function is given by the expectation value of the tensor product of the Pauli X operators. Uh, in this particular graph, we pro we plot uh, the XX correlation functions with different neighbor interactions uh, for uh, modulus of gamma by J less than one. Uh, uh, we keep the system size fixed here for 20 spins. So essentially N equals to one here denotes the nearest neighbor interactions uh, and N equals to two denotes the next nearest neighbors and, and so on. Uh, we observe that, uh, that the correlations are strongest uh, at n equals to one, uh, which implies that, uh, that a spin has the strongest influence on its nearest neighbors and reduces hen henceforth following an exponential, de uh, exponential decay for, for gamma by j ratios greater than or less than one, essentially away from the critical point. Uh, and we see that it reaches a non-zero asymptote, uh, which is what we would expect from an ordered ferromagnetic state. And something that we would like to do further uh, and visualize is, uh, is to calculate the correlation functions for the critical point for gamma is equal to j is equal to one and see whether they uh, algebraically decay following a parallel behavior or not as, as it is predicted theoretically. So that's something we haven't done, but we look forward to. And uh, then Alina will take you through the final few slides of the presentation. Yes, so finally we compared different variational ansätze for finding the ground state energy. Um, and in the diagram, we can see in red the mean field ansatz, which is not very well suited for solving quantum systems, um, especially in this low dimension. And as you can see, it is well off the other results. Um, the mean field ansatz is known as an exact variational ansatz that is with a rounding error. And the va variational parameters are the spin single spin wave functions, uh, psi. Um, the mean field approach works best in high dimensions where spins have more neighbors because in low dimensions, there are more fluctuations that uh, need to be accounted for. And uh, next from the top in blue is the Jastro ansatz. It is a more correlated ansatz. And um, in the short range version of it, it entangles nearest and next to nearest neighbors. And the parameters are uh, J1 and J2, which have to be learned. And then we're using the restricted Boltzmann machine in green. And this is very close to the results obtained by a fully connected uh, feed forward neural network with non-linear activation function and a summation layer, uh, which is displayed in uh, black. Um, and uh, finally, our conclusion, um, neural networks uh, proved to be an innovative and helpful uh, tool in many areas of science. And here we have presented you a way to look at quantum many body systems with the help of neural networks and the compact representation of quantum many body states on neural networks and uh, neural network quantum states allows uh, an easier way of examining these quantum many body states and their properties such as the ground state energy um, even for highly entangled states as um, was shown in uh, a paper by Calio and Troyer and as well by Desama. And uh, we have looked at different variation of ANSETSI and found that the restricted Boltzmann machine, even though um, it is arguably uh, one of the simplest neural networks, can find quite accurate results for the ground state energy. And it will be interesting to look at more advanced neural networks and see what their advantage, 
advances uh, can offer in this area in the future. And additionally, it will be interesting to see this method applied to other more complex models that are dynamic, um, uh, J1, J2, frustrated, dissipative, or time dependent. Uh, an example is a paper by Valenti uh, et al, who used, amongst others, a correlated uh, restricted Boltzmann machine ANSATS on the perturbatoric code model with uh, periodic boundary conditions. Um, additionally, De Salma in his paper noted that quantum computing can provide a boost to machine learning techniques. For example, when dealing with large amounts of data, one might want to use the quantum version of the fast Fourier transform, which is exponentially faster than the classical version. And another point is that quantum computers are intrinsically based on linear algebra, which can help solve a large number of matrix multiplications. Uh, thank you very much for listening to this presentation. Thank you, uh, Alina and Asmita, for this, uh, in my opinion, very neat, very clear presentation. I'd like to congratulate you for the, for the work you have done, and also to, to Joe uh, for, uh, for the uh, supervision of this project. So let us, uh, we have five minutes for questions. So again, colleagues, please, if you have any questions, go ahead and ask directly, or just write on the chat. Or raise your hand. Yeah, I've got a, I've got a sort of, sort of fairly general question. I think mm -hmm. it's, it's very interesting that you're looking at these, um, if you like, machine learning techniques to, to solve um, scientific problems. I mean, in the examples you gave, you already knew the exact solution, and so you, you were really just testing um, whether or not the, the technique would work. What sort of problems um, do you envisage where the exact solution or even an asymptotic solution is not well known and where these sorts of techniques can actually lead us to, to new scientific results that we, that we can't obtain anywhere else? Yeah, so uh, what well, we tried to look at this model basically because we had a test bed uh, using exact results. And as Alina mentioned in the conclusion uh, for physical systems, there are uh, frustrated models. There are different, uh, there are models that are based on different geometries in, in higher dimensions, maybe in two dimensional or three dimensional models there that aren't exactly solved, uh, but there, there have been quite a few numer numerical approaches that give an estimate of uh, uh, what its properties or energy might be. So that could be a place where, uh, where we could apply uh, uh, neural networks. And also, uh, I would say uh, for other realms of physics, uh, uh, maybe for uh, particle physics, where we try to separate, uh, you know, uh, where we have a lot of data that's collected at different colliders and uh, we try to separate uh, a particular uh, signal from a lot of different background noise. Uh, and work has actually been done uh, in, in a lot of these fields where they have successfully kind of separated a particular signal, which is, is just actually very hard because the, uh, uh, because the intermediate states kind of decay very fast and the products are similar. But uh, it has been done using both machine learning and, and quantum computation. So that might be another area. Um, so yeah, there were also um, um, examples where uh, they looked at uh, excited states instead of ground states, which can usually be uh, solved a bit easier, but the excited states uh, are not. And then um, you can look at different levels, basically, of that. Well, I think, thank you very much. Thank you. More questions? <clears throat> Okay, so if not, shall we thank uh, Asmita and Anina for this fantastic seminar? Thank you very much. Uh, very good. We have to keep moving, actually. I have to stop the recording.